Well, good morning, everybody. This is Kimberly Ray with Marine Conservation Network, and greetings to everyone. I know it's either early or early in the morning or early in the evening, but I'm glad you could join us. We're going to start out with I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're here to do today, and we're going to introduce everybody and give you a real good time and teach you about the ocean. So let's start off by, this is World Ocean Day, everybody. Happy World Ocean Day. This is a day that's very important, actually a week. There's a lot of things that are going on and hopefully you've made it to this one, but join all the other ones and learn all about the ocean and what you can do and why it's important. So we're going to start off talking about that we're launching, this is our first webinar. So we're going to spotlight five scientists that are out there making a difference, learning about what's going on in the ocean and learning what you can do about it to help protect it and conserve it. There, this is the big problem that we're facing right now in a lot of our oceans, is that the enormous amount of plastic trash that's in the ocean from the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and then all the trash that's ending up on the beaches, and in all of our oceans, all over the world. We are, and we're actually creating a food chain, our food chain to where all the plastic that's going into the ocean are breaking down into micro pieces, which are being eaten by fish. And the fish are then eaten by us. Therefore, we are eating our own trash. Everything that you put in the ocean that is not fish or any wildlife or anything like that that's in the ocean is plastic or poison, and it's going to us, into our systems. There's beach whales that are ending up dying because there's plastic in their stomachs. They're mistaking jellyfish or other food for, um, I'm sorry, plastic for other food, like jellyfish and whatever fish that they eat. They get it stuck in their throat, they choke. Um, a lot of times they get ghost netting wrapped around their, their tails. This plastic in our coral reefs. Our coral reefs are very important to the ocean. They help with the water being stable. They help with homes and food, or other types of fish and nutrients. Also, when you're out there surfing, we're with the, uh, the ocean. We're with the sharks. We're part of it. We are one. If the ocean wasn't there, we wouldn't be there. One thing that Sylvia Earle said in quotes, every other breath comes from the ocean. We must remember that, we must protect it, we must conserve it. Sharks are ending up in the ocean, they're being in danger too. They're running into all kinds of trash, sea, seaweed, this is seaweed it looks like, but the trash, kelp, ropes, all kinds of things are going on, plus human impact. Human impact meaning shark finning is going out there and that is tremendously, tremendously devastating the shark population. But what about our deep sea fish? Believe it or not, there's actually ocean trash in the deep sea. They found soda cans, they found plastic bottles. Your trash does not disappear. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. It does end up in the ocean. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn about all these things that are going on, all these things that are going on in all different parts of the ocean. And you're gonna find out what you can do about it and how you can help protect the ocean. So let's get started. Our first scientist is actually our young ambassador in Sri Lanka. She is 10 years old. And this little girl is gonna give you a run for your money, but she knows a lot and she's very smart. So let's start off with Alosha. Good morning, good evening, Alosha, how are you? Hi. Good evening or good morning or whatever time it is over there. <laughs> we get confused because there's so many time zones. Well, the ocean is a very big place, and we only have discovered maybe 5% of it, Olosha. What can you tell everybody about the deep sea that hasn't been discovered yet? Or how can we help with the plastic that's ending up in the, in the deep sea? How is it affecting it? Yeah, so, so, so plastic can affect the deep sea in a lot of different ways. So just in case, so, so most of our waste gets attached with barnacles, seaweed, and then they sink to the bottom. They sink to the deep sea and, and sometimes microplastic also sinks to the deep sea and the fish that are searching for, for crustaceans mistakenly eat 
in these small in these small particles and sometimes get trapped in these bottles so so the ocean especially the deep sea is not discovered like only 5% have been discovered so because of that So we are already destroying what we have when things that are lurking out there, waiting to be discovered. What, kind of, so what kinds of things have been found in the deep ocean? Yeah, like soda cans all rusted. So they did back from the 1970s or from the time that plastic was invented. So they date that old. And all the microplastics also found was also older. So all the, all the trash that gathered up in, in garbage patches is new plastic. So the old plastic turns into microplastics and some, some sink, get rusted. So, so plastic bags also sink to the bottom of the sea. And, and scientists had them Scientists have discovered that crustaceans in the Mariana Trench have eaten or consumed plastic. So, and in my country, that ship called the Express Pearl is also affecting all uh, a complex marine life. Yeah, so, so the oil from the ship and there has been 300 and million plastic microbeads have been set free from that ship and from very small animals. So these are some of those microbeads. These are plastic. Those are awfully tiny. <laughs> yeah. So what can we do about it? What can we do to help prevent all the plastic that's ending up in the in the deep sea? Is there anything we can do? Yeah, we, we can like do these three steps. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. Most of you must know about it. So so by doing so without one small gain, there's no great loss. That's a good way to put it. I like that. I like that very much. Well, thank you, Alosha. That was wonderful. That's, it's amazing to think that all that plastic can actually end all the, the way down into the abyss and down into the trench, that deep water. It's really amazing. You'd think it would stay on the top, but it doesn't, huh? Yeah, that's that's really good to know. And then that's right. That's right. And then yeah. how, long, how long does some of that plastic take to dissolve? Do you know? How, how long does it take for it to turn into microbeads? So, so it takes for a really long time. I, well, I'm not actually that good at numbers. <laughs> so it takes a really long time, more than a, like more more than hundred years for this to dissolve. Wow. So like uh, four hundred years. And that's a long time. That's too long to be out in the water, right? Yeah. Yeah. It turns. Uh, so the, the fish consume these microplastics and they hit up the food chain. And then it comes to us. Well, thank you. That's, that's very important for us to know. Thank you very much. All right, well, next we have Boothi. Boothi, are you, you can unmute. We have Boothi here. Yeah. She is a shark specialist in Sri Lanka. And I wanted to ask you, Boothi, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. If I'm not, please, please let me know. I want to pronounce your name correctly. But everyone seems to think that sharks are vicious man-eating killers. And that's usually because of the media and movies like Jaws are out there. But other than shark finning, there's another an ominous threat that sharks face with ocean plastic. Can you tell us what, it, what that is and how it's affecting the shark population? Yeah, Kimberly, uh, before giving an answer for your question, uh, I would like to uh, give a brief introduction about shark and race uh, and uh, regarding this. Uh, so I think we can start with that. Uh, 
actually shark have been in sea more than 450 million years so that is more than 200 million years before the first dinosaur ever existed so on the other hand uh, not like dinosaurs shark have survived five major mass extinct events so nature identified that the importance of the survivability of shark okay let's see how they differ from other species uh, actually they are cartilaginous fish in the ocean so not like bony fishes they are skeleton uh, composed with uh, cartilage which is more flexible structure uh, compared to the bones that's uh, that is the same material that you can feel inside your nose tips and ears so we can find these special animal uh, from coastal waters to deep uh, ocean waters so up to now uh, more than 125 species uh, have been recorded uh, discovered in the world ocean and roughly 600 species of sharks and 600 species of rays so uh, i would like to add some additional details uh, regarding the shark and ray uh, diversity here in sri lanka so so far uh, up to now we recorded more than 26000 uh, specimen so according to the blue resource trust checklist we have recorded 100 species of shark and rays that's mean 50 species of rays and 50 species of shark but most interesting fact is that out of 100 species four species may be new to science that's mean not only the sri lanka notice it's new to the world so we are working on that and near future we can give more details about this okay let's see why they are important to uh, conserve so i would like to give one example if we take silky shark and yellowfin tuna so yellowfin tuna takes two years to become mature while silky shark take 12 years on the other hand yellowfin tuna produce nearly 10 million of eggs in one spawning but silky shark produce 2 to 14 pups once in every two years that means extremely low okay let's talk about uh, manta ray so we all know the manta ray is the one of the largest ray species in the ocean manta ray live up to 60 years just like elephant and manta ray gives birth uh, one pups in every three to six years so the reproduction is a bit similar to the elephant as a well as lot of sharks live on averagely about 25 years like leopards so their fecundity and population recoveries are less same as elephant and leopard in a terrestrial environment but unfortunately we are not considering about the shark and race like terrestrial animal as well as in Mantaresa, not protected like elephants by the law here in Sri Lanka. Okay, I will give another example Greenland shark. It can live up to 500 years and take 150 200 years to become uh, or mature or produce pups, uh, as well as if we remove it from the marine environment before the 150 years then greenland sharks cannot produce pup and they cannot survive in the marine ecosystem so if we carefully analyze those all the scenarios in simple term we can say that low fecundity then late age at maturity slow growth rate make shark can raise more vulnerable species okay what are the importance of shark can raise so i will give one example here because we only have the limited time period so great white shark bull shark mako shark uh, and blue sharks are top level predators and control intermediate predators in the marine food chain so if we remove these top level predators from the marine ecosystem due to fishing then the number of intermediates will increase rapidly and remove the herbivore that feed on the algae so as a result of this 
algae will take over the coral reef and reduce biodiversity in particular ecosystem so likewise there are so many important so without having these cycles and mechanisms not even ocean ecosystem uh, the earth entire ecosystem we cannot uh, protect or survive okay just uh, going to talk about global fishery briefly so nearly 200 million sharks and rays kill in each year this is the almost 400 individual per minute here you can see some uh, in the uh, right hand side the pile of mobilized species at uh, one of the major harbor at sri lanka and the left hand side you can see the pile of trunk of the shark so they are mainly captured by gillnet and long light as target to non tag bycatch so when it comes to the sri lanka in sri lankan fishing vessels that target tuna fish sometimes bring fresh and spoiled shark as a bycatch in large scale in the large scale uh, harbors so why they are catching so they are catching to consume meat locally and obtain things to export country like singapore then hong kong and china for the shark fin soup as same scenario for the mobilites so mobila gill plate obtain uh, from mobilized species and the gill plate also export to the other countries uh, from sri lanka for the medicinal purpose okay even no excuses for the deep sea shark species the shark liver oil is obtained from deep sea sharks on the east coast and west coast of sri lanka and export to the uh, japan to make liver oil products so what we can do and what i can do and what you can do we all know obviously we are not consuming shark fin soup and i am asking not to consume shark fin soup and not to serve shark fin soup as well as major important thing is that so we can simply uh, avoid purchasing product like shark liver oil then shark teeth and their jaws and uh, jaws as a cerneus as well as leather product made out from uh, shark skin no stingray skins and we can have a habit like uh, some referring some guides so in some countries uh, you can refer seafood guide such as montreal seafood watch or good fish guide in the uk but in for the other countries if we buy fish from road sellers roadside sellers or market sellers or small scale land inside seller at that time we can ask from them and we can start to ask what fish is this and where was it caught how these creatures have been harvested then whether it is from sustainable fishery or whether it is from one by one fishery or is it from unsustainable gillnet fishing like guys we can ask questions so this will make awareness among the fish sellers then land inside sellers and market sellers and even the fishers to shift the sustainable activities so finally we can conduct awareness program and educate the public and fisher communities and school children on the importance and protecting shark and prey species so kimli i'm going to give answer for your question now so plastic pollution the plastic pollution is the one of the biggest problem in the world but we cannot have people to think that plastic pollution is the primary issue faced by species like shark and ray but the biggest problem is the overfishing yeah we know that the issues like plastic uh, while certainly detrimental to the marine ecosystem as whole and become more secondary issue for the species like uh, shark and ray so uh, yes it is obvious that uh, microplastic uh, accumulated in the coastal species uh, coastal fish especially filter feeders and that can be transport to the apex predators like mako shark then blue shark and bull shark so but i would uh, like to add some uh, details regarding that so there are several articles uh, 
articles regarding this. According to that, the microplastic or plastic in the filter feeding shark can rest like mobilities, uh, mobilids or whale shark, which decrease their reproductivity potential and affinity towards the food. So they will die due to the hunger or starvation if plastic materials are accumulated in their bellies. So we weren't to concern about this matter. But however, at the present, the number of species that are dying due to the uh, plastic pollution are largely insignificant in comparison to the number of being killed through the fisheries. So the thing is, the biggest problem is not plastic pollution for this species. The biggest problem is the overfishing because so many species at the edge of the extinction due to the overfishing. I will give an example. In here in Sri Lanka in 2019, we conducted one survey regarding the sawfish species. So up to now, the last uh, five decades, we only found five uh, sawfishes uh, from uh, our uh, data set. So we can say that the sawfishes are commercially extinct in our water. Likewise, the other species are in big other species also have big threats. So we have, and we want to think that uh, how to protect these animals uh, and how to have sustainable uh, fisheries. So finally, I would like to add, everything is interconnected. So we need to uh, ensure our impact are positive. So fish are limited resource and we need a proper, proper management plan and uh, for the managed uh, fisheries and to have sustainable uh, fisheries and to conserve these amazing creatures uh, in our water. Uh, thank you very much, Kim Lee. Thank you, Budhi. You actually made a really good point. I really loved your presentation. The, the theme of today is ocean plastic, but you're absolutely right. There are more than one obstacle out there in the ocean that's starting to damage it and take away our livelihood and our future and the ocean's future. So thank you for pointing that out. That was wonderful. Yeah. Well, next we're gonna be bringing up Kyle. And Kyle is in Florida, my home state, where I'm actually born and raised from. Raised from. And I actually grew up near the Everglades. Hey, Kyle, how are you? I'm doing okay today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Now, you're down there in, are you in the Everglades today? No, actually, today I am in the Blackwater State Forest up in the northwest panhandle of the state. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, that wasn't exactly where I was born, but I have been there. Yeah. <laughs> now, there seems to be more serious concerns, though, with our reefs and mangroves. That's, there's just too many tourists out there. But there's also the big threat of plastic pollution because of the tourists. How is that affecting the areas out there in Florida? Well, actually, to kind of add on what Booty was saying, we've here in Florida, we've got a huge problem with a couple different things as it relates to mangroves and coral reefs. We have the plastics issue, and then we have several others. We have stony tissue disease. We have rising seawater temperatures. So the World Federation for Coral Reef Conservation has been trying to combat some of those and various methods for uh, several years now. And what we're what we were finding is the small cleanups that we were able to organize as far as beach cleanups, mangrove cleanups, reef cleanups, things like that. We're only resolving a portion of the problem and not even necessarily getting ahead of it. So what we've decided to do internally to combat all of those issues broadly is the World Federation has partnered with quite a few organizations, quite a few nonprofits and what we're calling a, a Mesoamerican coalition. We've got over a hundred projects and more than 20 NGOs that are working to resolve 
issues across the board, not just necessarily plastic in this area or red tide issues in this area, but we've partnered with organizations like Intel Reef. Intel Reef is bioengineering a scalable solution for species specific substrates that will attract spawn erosion and all of those work together. Then you've got organizations that we're trying to coordinate with that would include Beyond Coral, who has Charm, which is their coral human air out of coral farming, makes it a little more, makes it a lot more um, in an area that can put some of those corals back or can be used for research. And then you've got organizations out there that are doing uh, Nav Ocean, for example. Nav Ocean has a sail and solar specifically for data collection you can do on and it opens the opportunity for increased research in many fields and we've got a lot of that picking up in popularity both ocean science and with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So moving forward, the World Federation's in a position to help collaborate with all of those groups and help bring data necessary, whether it is in regards to plastics in the oceans, plastics in the food chain, or, or any other form of, it's helped us kind of narrow our focus, which has taken, but wasn't going to be long-term impactful. And it's allowed us to focus on some we'd like to utilize across the board. Okay, I think we've lost Kyle. Kyle's having some internet Kimberly, connection I'm out there. Kyle, issue. can you hear me? <laughs> can you hear me, Kyle? I can hear you, I cannot see you. Okay, you are cutting out quite a bit. I, you were fine in the very beginning, but now you're starting to cut out a lot towards the middle and the end. So I'm going to go to um, the next speaker and then come back to the last part of your of your talk. See if you maybe can move to a different location or something, maybe um, to a different spot. Okay. I'll be back with you in just a moment. But thank you anyway. We're just, we're going to keep you here, so don't worry. We're not losing you. Well, while while we have everybody on, I just want to let you know. Anybody that's watching this right now, go ahead and please leave your comments, stop by and say hello, text in your, your questions, and we will follow up with them after the posting of this video. We will be back in contact with you. So I apologize if we're not answering any questions that are out there, but feel free to stop by and say hi, post any questions that you have, and we'll answer them after this has been posted. So our next speaker is actually my, uh, ocean sister that we call each other she's here in california and we're going to have april speak to you april how are, are you there girl how are you doing yeah i'm here how are you thanks for having I'm great. me i'm so glad you got to make it this morning yeah it's great to be here now you are a surfing specialist you teach surfing out in ventura is that correct so i'm in los angeles and yeah, so I'm an ocean researcher and a surf coach where most, and I am certified to dive. Most everyone in my field, marine research is a diver. 
And, you know, I've had my C card since 1998, but I've also been a surfer because I'm from here. I'm from Los Angeles, Southern California, born and raised, and I spent my life on the ocean. And while I love diving and getting under the water and seeing everything, I'm far more active and just love surfing. So throughout the pandemic, I really took, I've been working with sharks and ocean research for decades, but through the pandemic, everybody was inside and surfing became even more popular. And I'd already been, <laughs> So I'd already been a surf coach, but I went ahead and got even more academic about it and got certified with the International Surfing Association and re-upped my Red Cross lifeguard and all that. So one of the approaches I like to take to research, Kimberly, as you know, is getting people comfortable in the ocean because the more they understand it, the more they understand the need to conserve it. They understand sharks. They understand why plastic is important. Um, and where I am, fortunately, here on the west side, I'm close to Santa Monica, there's almost nearly all single use plastic was banned until the pandemic came and we're getting back to that but single use plastic is a really big part as a lotion everybody had talked about and here in southern california there's the southern california coastal water resources project which is a not a government organization but they work with governments and other ngos here in southern california to research the problem of micro and nano plastics it's a uh, just last October, they were talking about even in our rain, even in mist, there's nanoplastics in there and they're just ubiquitous in our air and water. And like everybody was pointing out, you're eating, if you're eating the oceans, you're eating plastics and there's bioaccumulation and all those toxins that leach from plastics. So it's a huge issue, Kimberly. Right. I, and you're absolutely right about that. Can you tell me how how is it surfers and sharks, what's the best way for surfers to integrate with sharks out there? How can they be aware and be safe for themselves, but also keep the sharks safe while they're, they're surfing? It's a great question and it's often one. So my, as to just be clear, my main job is ocean researcher and I picked up, uh, I was working with other nonprofits coaching surfing and then I got certified. So I don't go out and advertise as a surf coach it's like if you happen to work with one of the nonprofits i work with or a friend of know me you can get surf lessons and in those i integrate shark education because one of my biggest projects is called shark pr el porto shark is my org and our mission is ocean and shark conservation through research education and action and our two primary research focus pieces are shark pr and chemical oceanography now in the shark pr piece I figured out a long time ago that surfers are some of the best community scientists. We've got people of many generations here. I learned from people, you know, 10, 20, and 30 years older than me surfing. And these guys and ladies have seen the water since the 1950s, 1960s, and they've seen it change here in Southern California. Myself, I've seen the change since the 1980s, like a place in Ventura where Surfers Point, the stairs used to go down like you know really far and now there's four or five stairs going into the sand so you can see the climate change and things happening in my lifetime so showing surfers that they are an active part of the ocean environment and how important sharks are as an apex predator nearly everyone who's been surfing for you know any long period of time here in southern california or around the world has seen a shark we have to remember there's over four or five hundred species of shark and they're everything from eight inches to 60 feet long. So sharks are not just the big scary jaws that the movies have shown us, but there are all kinds, much like all of our, everyone here has been talking about the sharks, the rays, all the cartilaginous fish. They're really important in our ecosystem and they usually occupy a top space. So by working with surfers and letting them understand that they have a huge voice and a huge part in ocean conservation and they are on the front lines to be shark advocates then that is our way in because if we protect the sharks we protect the ocean we protect the waves you know sylvia earls no blue no green you know no i don't remember how it goes exactly but same with every major ocean researcher you talk to we talk everybody knows the importance of the ocean 60 70 80 percent of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean depending on whose study you look at, but the fact is, at least every other breath comes from the water and sharks and the big 
marine mammals, all the large animals that are apex predators have got to be protected. And surfers are on the front line. So I love to empower them to understand how to speak to others who freak out because the first question someone asks you when you say, oh yeah, I'm a surfer, they say, aren't you afraid of sharks? Almost always they, they want to know, have I ever seen a shark? Yep. Aren't I afraid of them? That's what they want to know. Oh, I don't want to know how to surf because I'm afraid of sharks. To which I say, great. Okay, well, that's perfect opportunity to get some education and understand that they're incredibly important. And there's no reason to be frightened to get in the water because quite honestly, over 4,000 people die every single day from automobile accidents somewhere on the planet where less than 10 lose their lives from sharks every year. So the statistics don't lie. It's not slanting it some way. It's just what we pay attention to and humans fear what we don't understand. So getting that education is key. Very, that's very true. Very true, April. Education is key because that's how we know how to better our lives and how to better the life of the ocean and how to prepare for our futures. So that's wonderful. So thank you very much, April. I'm glad you were able to stop by this morning, girl. So next we have Rebecca. And Rebecca, how, are you there? How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing very well. And you are in the UK, is that correct? Yeah, I'm in the UK. So it's uh, early afternoon here. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to have you here. And Rebecca's from Marine Diaries. And Rebecca, I wanted to ask you, we've seen so many pictures of whales washing ashore dead. And the necropsies usually reveal that it's from plastic in their stomachs, aside from shipping collisions and other things. And that's really a horrible way to die. In your opinion, what can we do to stop that from them dying from the collisions or dying from even ingesting plastic? Yeah, it is. Uh, it's a really, really big issue. Um, there's so much plastic in the ocean, uh, which some of the other speakers have already kind of mentioned. Um, and to, to give you some stats, there's at least kind of 8 million tons of plastic that goes into the ocean every single year. Um, and plastic kind of makes up about 80% of all of the debris that is in the ocean. Um, and it's found kind of all the way from the surface to the deepest parts of the ocean, like the Marianas Trench, for example. Um, and yes, yeah, plastic can be a contributing factor to death um, by stranding. Um, and if people don't know what stranding is, um, that's basically when kind of marine mammals and um, usually whales or um, dolphins come ashore um, and they kind of get stuck on the beach and basically as the tide goes back out um, they die um, unfortunately um, because they can't make their way back to the ocean properly. Um, some kind of uh, necropsies, so um, looking at the body after the animal has died, um, do find that there are large amounts of plastic in the gut of these animals. It's not always the cause of death. Um, sometimes it is, um, sometimes it's an, a combination of different factors, um, but a lot of the animals that are found do have plastic in the gut, even if it's um, not the cause of death. Um, so the problem with that is um, when these animals are kind of ingesting plastic, um, it obstructs the digestive system. Um, so it can prevent proper digestion of their food if there's large quantities. And it also basically gives the animal um, the sense of feeling full. So they won't then go and hunt for um, fish or jellyfish or whatever they usually eat um, because they think they're already full. And um, you know all of the kind of hormone signals are, are telling their brain that no, you're full, you don't need to eat now. Um, and that essentially leads them to kind of starve to death um, as well. So another kind of issue of, um, you know, these kind of marine mammals and, and whales specifically eating plastic is um, the toxicity of some plastic um, chemicals that leach out. Um, so things like plasticizers, there's a lot of chemicals in plastic um, that unfortunately kind of can leak out, um, especially in the marine environment, um, or if, if that plastic has been ingested. Um, and those essentially can bioaccumulate up the food chain as well. 
Um, so even if these kind of whales aren't eating the plastic directly, their prey, such as fish, might be also eating plastic and kind of um, these chemicals are in their bodies. So when the, the whale eats the fish, um, they get larger quantities because they eat so many fish at once. Um, and they also usually have quite fi uh, high fat content um, in their bodies. And this is a really excellent place for all of these chemicals to just be stored. Um, and this can have effects on fertility um, as well as kind of immunosuppressant um, issues as well. So this kind of leads to um, whales and other marine animals being really vulnerable to um, disease and predators. Um, and then obviously can sometimes lead to, to stranding as well. Um, another issue, <laughs> which there are a lot of, um, is that plastics don't dissolve, they don't break down, they just break up into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, and the smaller they get, the more dangerous they can become because they become more available to kind of smaller organisms. Um, so, you know, things like uh, zooplankton, really, really small um, organisms in the ocean that are actually vital to the food web functioning properly, um, can consume these microplastics. Um, and we're even seeing nanoplastics now, which there is not very much research about. Um, and the smaller these pieces get, the, the more areas they can get into in, in different parts of the body. Um, so there has been some studies to show that plastic, uh, microplastics and nanoplastics can get into um, kind of muscle and also cross the, the blood brain barrier and cause some hormonal impacts, um, which was a study on, on fish. So um, it's, it's really bad. Um, and another, another kind of big impact, especially on larger um, marine organisms like, like whales um, and dolphins and turtles and things like that is, is ghost nets. Um, so if anyone doesn't know what a ghost net is, it's basically a kind of fishing net that has been um, either lost or purposefully discarded at sea. Um, this happens sometimes because of storms, but there are also some people who um, throw nets overboard if they're damaged because it's, they're really expensive to dispose of because they're thousands or hundreds of, of meters long. They're, they're so, so big, these industrial fishing nets. Um, and ghost gear is basically estimated to make up about 10% of all ocean plastic pollution. Um, so it's, it's a really large percentage. Um, and these nets kind of drift, drift through the ocean and continue to act as a net. Um, so they catch all types of marine life. They, they also kind of get entangled in marine life, which can um, cause you know, injury, but also can limit kind of foraging activities and things like that. Um, so we need to kind of sort this, this issue out, um, you know, there's, there's lots of plastic in, in the ocean, um, and it, it's really important to conserve things like, um, whales because, uh, they are really, really valuable, um, as kind of carbon sinks. Um, so whales specifically, um, the, the kind of larger baleen whales like blue whale, um, can store on average about 33 tons of, of carbon. Um, so that's, that's a lot. <laughs> the more we have, the, the better the ocean will be. Um, and they're also really, really vital to carbon and nutrient cycling in the ocean. Um, so things like whale poo um, and their carcasses, um, when they die, kind of sink to the, the deeper parts of the ocean. And this transports things like nutrients as well as carbon, uh, which then get kind of locked away in the deep sea. Um, so whale poo is really, really rich in iron um, and whale wee, which apparently they wee a lot, um, <laughs> urea, um, which transports nitrogen around the ocean as, as well. Um, and they're also just super important to the marine food web. Um, they consume vast quantities of food um, a blue whale can eat up to 40 million krill in one day. Um, so they're really kind of providing that top down control on the food web and making sure everything kind of functions correctly. Um, 
and they've kind of inspired things like culture um, mythical creatures um, and even some scientific advances so um, there have been some wind turbine blades that were inspired by um, the kind of bumps on a humpback whale's um, fin which is really really cool okay. um, so yeah it's, it's something that's really really important um, that we need to to try and address what can we do to help them not get caught in these nets out there in the open ocean yeah i think that's a it's a really good question and i think there's a there's a lot of things that we as individuals can do as well as businesses and governments um, we all need to kind of play our part um, but for, for anyone who's interested in you know doing doing something on an individual level um, eating less fish is actually a really, really great way to stop plastic getting into the ocean because you're just reducing the amount of fishing gear that is there. Um, you don't have to go completely vegan, just eating a bit less um, and trying to um, get your fish from sustainable um, kind of methods. So um, I think Budi mentioned Poland line, which is a really great way of um, catching fish in a more sustainable manner. Um, you can also kind of try and go plastic free in, in different areas of your life. I would recommend kind of starting in one place, like your bathroom or your kitchen, um, and then moving on to another once you've kind of formed those habits and you're kind of comfortable. You don't have to do everything at once. You don't have to throw all, all your things away and replace them with bamboo or right. steel. It's, you know, if something, something breaks and it's not repairable then the best next best option would be to buy something maybe secondhand that's that's non-plastic um but that's not to say that you know the items that you already have aren't um fantastic and should be kept um for as long as possible um so again um like um one of the other speakers mentioned um you know we need to go for that kind of refuse reuse repair reduce kind of right. cycle um, which I think <laughs> has been kind of preached about um, for a long time. Definitely when I was at school, um, we learned about that. And I think, yeah, I think a lot of the focus has been on recycle and really we should be looking to kind of refuse and reuse, repair and reduce first. Um, so you can refuse single use plastic, like um, plastic stirrers, single use coffee cups, things like that. Um, get reusable items, um, preferably non-plastic, but if they are plastic, that's still better than kind of single use. Um, and repair what you have, don't just throw it away as soon as it breaks. Um, and that goes for kind of buying new things as well, try and buy things that will last, um, that you won't have to just keep throwing away every couple of months. Um, and just in general, reduce the amount of plastic that you, that you buy. Um, so by doing to to achieve that you can um make your own um either kind of making your own snacks your own meals uh, you can also make your own toiletries um face scrub is a great one to make at home toothpaste is possible um loads and loads of things you can actually make at home right. it's really fun as well um you can buy things in bulk um there are especially in the us i think some really great kind of plastic free shops um that you can go to you take your own Kind of containers and um, you fill them up it actually can also be cheaper in some cases not always yes. um but generally if you um also kind of buy less and buy second hand um that will reduce the amount of kind of virgin plastic that you're kind of consuming um and finally you can kind of sign petitions there are loads around um that are either targeting specific companies or um governments or trying to create like holistic change um so have a google sign some petitions um, and share them around your network very good very good thank you very much i mean this is you're absolutely right there is a lot that everybody can do don't be overwhelmed by it just do one little thing to start off and build your way up. A lot of people expect to do it overnight. They expect to do the big step overnight and it's not gonna happen. But if you do just one thing, one thing from one person from over, over 7 billion people in the world, you'll make a big impact. So that was perfect that you said that. Thank you very much. Kyle, are you still on, hun? I am. Okay, I can hear you clearly, but I don't see you. Did you have anything that you wanted to recap since we lost half of your speech? <laughs> uh, 
no, I, I said that's uh, you have a very um, bad connection. I think we're going to have to try this lost again. Lost a large <laughs> portion of that. I yeah. think we can just. That's okay. We'll have you back on again, and when, and the next time we have you back on, we'll have you in a place to where you won't lose your connection because we really want to hear what you have to say. Certainly. Well, this has been wonderful, guys. I mean, this is this is World Ocean Day, but this whole week is all about saving the ocean and preserving it because that is where your future comes from. That's where your life, your medicine, your food, and even your mental and emotional health comes from the ocean. So this is a very special day today. So we're gonna have, go back to Alosha, which is our young ambassador in Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And she's gonna close us out and talk to us a little bit more about what's going on out the, in the oceans that you really probably aren't aware of because it's out of sight, out of mind. It's a big phrase that we, we go by because that's how you make people aware. You, they realize they don't see it, it must not be there, that's not true. So Alosha, I want you to take a lead, hon. I want you to tell us all about the ocean and what we can do about it that we haven't already talked about or if you wanna reiterate something so that people really understand why it's so important. Yeah. Okay, now I, I'm gonna start. So actually, okay. so, so, so the deep sea is a cold and dark place. So we have to light things up. Now let's start. So actually, what is the deep sea? The deep sea is, is actually 200 feet, 200, 200 meters below the ocean surface. So it starts right after the sunlight zone then passes on to the twilight zone. So that's where the deep sea starts. And it's really dark here. And so there's a high amount of biodiversity down here. So, so, so it's like a ton of weight on your pinky finger, which is the pressure, which if a human's down there, it will be turned into a human pancake. So, so there's no light here. So how do, how do they see down here? Well, bioluminescence or GFP. It was first described in a jellyfish called the Aquaria Victoria. So it's used as a genetic highlighter in science. So the thing that is, so when, when the jellyfish absorbs uh, blue light and then it turns into green light and different species of animals have turned that into all sorts of colors red blue green yellow orange and many other different colors so the, a, a certain species of corn jellyfish uh, releases bioluminescence in in sort of undulating waves so that's how it gets its name because there are little photophores which are lying next to each other which are kind of like a comb so there are all sorts of bioluminescence down here. So they could, they could be used for all different sorts of purposes. Like hunting, hunting, mating purposes, how to, uh, how to find, find everyone here and to scare away predators. So let's check one of the different mechanisms. Going mucus. So, so first a fish or a shrimp creates a mucus inside its mouth. And then it takes it, it it takes bioluminescence in it, and then when it squirts it out, it's a it's a cloud of sticky mucus, glowing blue. So if an if a predator like an anglerfish is going for the little fish, so it it ejects that and the and the anglerfish swims away. And another different mechanism, a certain species of jellyfish, which which sends uh, in circular waves. So that bioluminescence pattern actually helps the jellyfish escape because, so it calls in another predator of the animal that is trying to eat that jellyfish. So, so hunting. So hunting is also very complex. So some fish can even cloak themselves to get away from predators or, or catch their prey. So the dragonfish. 
The dragonfish is one of these animals who, who can master bioluminescence. So they're actually, their bioluminescence lights can help them become invisible. So there's, there's a, there are light photophores in, in, in the eyes, near the, uh, under the eyes, which, which is like, so you can turn in invisible and you can on it, off and on. Not the anglerfish. The dragonfish can see the predator or the prey, but they can't see the dra dragonfish. So, and hatchetfish. Hatchetfish have silvery color and they have bioluminescence in them too. And when they glow up, the silvery color matches in with the, with the ocean color. So, and you can find many species of sharks here. And they also have bioluminescence. So let's go to the ones who doesn't have bioluminescence. Like goblin sharks. Goblin sharks actually have out protruding jaws, like rubber pongs. So it's waiting for their meal like this. And then the jaws actually shoot out of its mouth, grasping and locking the prey in. And the, and the goblin sharks make sure that the prey is in it. And frilled sharks. Frilled sharks are actually the source which sea serpents came from. And, and they're named for their frilly like gills. And they have 350 teeth and 25 rows of teeth. So it's like pitchfork shaped. So when it's easy for a fish to swim in, but it's it's hard to get out. So the Megamount shark is huge, but harmless and has bioluminescence inside its mouth, which helps attract prey into it. So, so scientists think that scientists thought that the Megamount sharks come rarely to the surface, but it's actually an everyday migration when there's no predators looking around, not even humans to spot them. So because of that night light inside their mouth, they could catch the shrimp easily. So, and cookie cutter sharks. You, so they, they actually have bioluminescent patterns. They have bioluminescent patterns that are shaped like a small fish. And then a bigger fish thinks you, you, he can eat this fish. And then, then the one swims up to it, so the cookie cutter shark grows forward and then it latches on to the fish or marine mammal. Then it twists it and then grabs a piece of fish and then swims away down to the deep. So even great whites are feared of this little shark. So there have been lots of bite marks seen in marine mammals, sharks, seals, and others. So and lantern sharks. So they have a reason to be called this. So from all sides, it's light up. So it, so from the side, there's a greenish glow, which helps it also blend into the environment. And, and it has bioluminescent spines, which are poison, warning a predator not to eat it. And from the underbelly, that there's bioluminescence down here. So when, when a predator is looking upwards, so it only can see the ocean waves from the top. So over here, there's going on a fascinating battle of the giant squid and sperm whale. So, so the giant squid can be longer than normal squid. And so, so does the colossal squid, which is larger than the giant squid. And both have, have the eyes size of a dinner plate, the largest eyes in the world. And they all, so, so, so there's a great battle. So, but first, how does this marine mammal uh, and through the crushing pressure? So, all thanks to the sperm setting inside its head. So the sperm is all oily when it's up the, up at, at the surface. And it turns hard as rock when it's under pressure. So, so there, 
So, so scientists know this because there have been scars, scars of giant suck, suckers. So you, you know the suckers of an octopus, it's all soft. So actually the suck and the giant squid suckers are armed with cutting teeth. So that's what leaves the scars on the sperm whale's body. So you can see these in washed up whales, sperm whales and, and like live ones, which are ready to save a bit. So, so, in the, so in the deep sea, there's no food allowed except for prey and predator. So, so what's the other way that they get their food? Marine snow. Marine snow is not like the snow uh, you used to make snowmen or snowballs. It's actually animal debris, plant debris, and anything like food that drops out from, from the surface of the ocean. It's kind of like a full rain for the animals that live down there. So, and hydrothermal vent is another source of food. Oh, black, they are also called black smoke, smokers. So, so these, uh, so scientists always thought that all life began with, with sunlight, but that's not true. They also begin with heat. Yes, you heard me, heat. So, so there's this cycle called the chemosynthesis. The same as the photosynthesis, but uses heat. So, so there are bacteria called chemosynthetic bacteria, which absorbs heat and turn it into energy. And then some animals eat the chemosynthetic bacteria as food, and then some store them in their bodies, like the giant tube worm. So giant tube worms don't have a gut, they don't have mouths, they don't have digestive systems, like they only have body structures. So they keep the chemosynthetic bacteria in their in their fleshy body. And they also live in hydro near hydrothermal vents. And yeti crabs swing their arms around uh, the above the hydrothermal vent, capturing the chemosynthetic bacteria. And then it eats it. And lion shrimp. Lion shrimp are really amazing because they can see heat, kind of like rattlesnakes. So they can see heat. So they can feel what kind of heat from the hydrothermal vent. Just in case they get lost, they just see the heat from far away. And crabs, especially the giant Japanese, the Jap <laughs> the Japanese spider crab. So they're actually like a spider and has eight legs and are huge. I've seen them for myself. And these guys also sometimes feed on these chemosynthetic bacteria. Okay, and sea cucumbers, pelagic sea cucumbers. So you, uh, they're not the reference to uh, a vegetable. Actually, there are animals which belong to the family of echinoderms. So they can swim. Yeah, that's right, they can swim. So some, some have wing-like folds in their bodies and they can actually fly or swim, swim through the water. So they can live in the deepest depths of the Mariana Trench. Scientists thought wrong that no life exists in the deep sea but there is so much life down there. So in the deepest diving fish is, is the Mariana snailfish, which can survive extreme depth, depth and pressure. So the pressure is crushing here. Like you put a ton of weight on your pinky finger. And anthropods. So anthropods are small crustaceans which feed on dead carcasses. They can actually clear a whole weight in just a few days. And giant isopods. Giant isopods are, are larger than the average wood lights. So they can be huge, enormous, and are like uh, an alien creature that just came out of Star Wars. So, 
So the deep sea is still so undiscovered and we're destroying it even though we're knowing that there's deep undiscovered life down there. So the main threat to deep sea life is bottom trawling and plastic pollution. Oh, I forgot to say something. Deep sea coral reefs. Yeah, deep sea coral reefs. So unlike the shallow water cousins, so they can survive extreme pressure and the cold. They do not need, need sunlight to survive. So scientists haven't still figured out yet how they live down there. So yeah, there are whole coral reef structures that can be destroyed by bottom trawlers in just a matter of seconds. So those coral reefs could have taken off hundreds of years to grow. So they could all be destroyed in seconds. And plastic is also getting consumed by animals as we speak. So, so the ship called the MV Express Pearl that has burned and sinked in, in, my, in the Indian Ocean, which also has a high amount of deep sea biodiversity and is home to one of the rarest living fossils, the coelocanth. And there's a, there's a species of snail called the iron foot snail. So it actually has iron inside its body, which allows it to stay. And it's like the miniature version of a land model, land, land snail. So, so the bottom trawlers strike a monster like a raging fire that drives ev everything in its path until there's nothing but stone and ash. So, so we could protect our undiscovered deep sea environments by demanding less deep sea fish. And we can stop plastic pollution that is harming our whole undiscovered ocean. So together, we can save the oceans. Thank you. Gotta unmute myself. Very good, Alosha. That was awesome. What a bunch of information that's in that little head of yours. I love it. I am so proud of you. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, everybody else on the board. Booty, Rebecca, April, and Kyle, we thank you very much for stopping by today. Everybody, again, like I said, if you had any comments or questions, I hope you posted them down below. We will answer them following up from posting this video. And this has been phenomenal. You guys have visited, have been a part of a milestone for Marine Conservation Network. This is our very first webinar, and there's going to be many more. We're going to have more interviews coming. We're going to have more webinars coming, so stay tuned. And we have merchandise. If you're looking for merchandise, to buy with us, too. But all these other people that have joined us today, all these wonderful, awesome scientists and ocean protectors, they have their own nonprofits. And please check them out. I'll put their links below the video after we're done and you can visit their, their websites and you can help donate and help them out, volunteer for them. And I want everybody on the board to say this with me together. Together, we can make oceans we can make of make difference. We can make a difference. An ocean difference. <laughs> a little bit of lack of time think. difference, but that's okay. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you everybody in the audience for watching us. And remember, there's going to be a lot more coming out, so stay tuned. See y'all later and have a wonderful, wonderful World Ocean Day. Bye. Okay, bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Everyone bye. stay safe from, from that raging virus. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah. we all Thank will you. stay safe and strong because we got a lot of work to do.